Hello, everybody. Dr. B here. Uh, this is the module 14 video. It's a fluids, one of my favorite topics. Uh, T-shirt for the day. Might be a repeat. I can't remember. Never trust an atom. And then down at the bottom, it says, because they make up everything. Um, so anyway, it's a pun, but they do make up all matter. Uh, everything is made out of atoms. And so it's just a play on words. Anyway, um, let's see. Let's get to it. Here is a picture of an SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, and this is a wind tunnel test. You can see the smoke uh, streams going up and around it. Uh, it's a very aerodynamic design. Uh, it was also meant to evade radar. And uh, it's also the fastest plane in the world at one point. I think it's the fastest operational plane currently. Um, don't really, not, not quite sure about that. I know the A-12 was faster. And uh, I was just doing a little bit of reading um, about the A-12. Um, the A-12 was designed to be able to handle speeds of like 2,300 miles per hour um, over long periods of time. And uh, to be able to do that as as it was going that fast, it's going past a lot of air, there's a lot of drag. Um, and so just like when you rub your hands together, there's friction. Uh, when, you're, when you're going at 2,300 miles per hour, there's a lot of air friction, okay? And we call it drag. Um, but that heats things up, just like when you rub your hands together, they heat up. And so they needed uh, materials that would withstand the really high temperatures. And so it's a little bit off topic, but I found it really interesting. Uh, so they needed a, um, they discovered that there was a titanium alloy uh, that they could use. Um, and so they needed to have enough titanium to be able to build these A-12 airplanes. And it turns out um, that they were buying the titanium from Russia or from the Soviet Union, as it may have been at the time. Um, but anyway, so it's sort of interesting that they were buying the titanium from the people that they were then spying on with the plane and or, or at least that they were using that they that the plane was designed really to uh, counteract. I'm not sure if it was a spy plane or not. It's not really my uh, forte, but I do find it interesting. All right, now back to the topic. Why, are, why am I showing this? You can see the air flowing around and the air is, why, why am I showing the air flowing around? Well, has to do with this question right here, which is on page one of your packet. Which of the following things is a fluid? Think about it, pick your answer. Correct answer is both, okay? Water and air are both fluids. All liquids and all gases are fluids because they can flow and because they do other things similarly in terms of exerting pressure as a function of depth, exerting buoyant force, um, there's, there's lots of similarities. There are differences between liquids and gases, but liquids and gases are both considered to be fluids. And the reason we group things together um, is because of commonalities. Uh, we always group as many things together as possible because then you have less things to remember. Um, just like with acceleration, we have summation of forces equals MA. And we said acceleration, well, that applies to things that are changing direction, things that are slowing down, things that are speeding up. And why, why should we have a different law for speeding up versus changing direction or slowing down? We don't need to because summation of forces equals MA applies to all three of those. Well, same thing here. All right, let's back up a little bit. Um, some things to keep in mind. Make sure you have all the supplies for the module 14 lab. That's the last one that you have to do where you're hands-on. Um, the module 15 lab is, is smaller and it's, it's in a simulation. All right. So make sure you have those supplies. Module 15 overall is very small, uh, but you don't want to skip it. Uh, the you know so last chance to, to bring up your grade in the homework category and the uh, lab category. Um, and in particular, if you were only going to do one assignment out of module 15, do the lab. Um, that's that's going to affect your grade the most up or down. So strongly encourage you to do that and to get it out of the way before. Um, you know, just, just so you have more time to be able to keep going and start doing review problems to get ready for the final. All right, here are the learning objectives. These are, I don't need to go through these here. This is what we're gonna be doing in this module. And this, this list is available on the uh, introduction uh, page in Canvas. It's the first 
uh, page in each module is uh, that overview page and it lists those. All right, so in fluids, we're gonna cover a few different topics, density, pressure, buoyant force being the, the main ones there. Mm, excuse me. All right, so density. This is a term you're familiar with. Um, you may or may not know the definition uh, as far as the, the formula to be able to calculate it. It's mass per volume. It's kind of also an explanation of, um, of the topic as well, but it's, it's basically how tightly packed the matter is, how much mass there is in a certain space. Uh, this right here, a lot of people, when you're writing it on your own, you're writing it down on your paper, you just write it as a P. It is not a P. And you might think, ah, who cares? What's the difference? Well, the, the problem is, if you write it as a P and you're doing a problem that involves both density and pressure, which there are some, you're going to be in trouble because how are you going to tell the difference if you're making the same symbol for both of them? If you do, you won't be the first or the last person to, to do that, make that mistake and get confused and get the wrong answer, but it's avoidable. Learn how to make something that looks different than a P. Okay, Greek letter rho, I just draw it as a leaning forward P. Um, and I also curve this part right here. You'll notice on a P, that's like a 90 degree angle right there on the upper left corner. And here that's not happening. And the row is leaning forward. This part of the stick, so to speak, is slanted, not straight, like on a capital P. So that's what I do when I'm handwriting them. I think it works pretty well. Uh, you can do something a little different if you want, but that works quite well. Uh, this capital V for velocity, I'm sorry, for volume, not velocity. Um, lowercase v is velocity, as you well know. Uh, let's see. Units. Well, the units on both sides have to be the same. This SI unit for mass, you know, kilogram, SI unit for volume. Well, we haven't done volume before, but I think you can figure it out. I'm going to give you a moment and pause the video here if you want to think about it. All right. Well, you know, when you calculate volume like of a box, it's length times width times height. And each of those would get measured in an SI unit of meters. So the SI unit of volume is meters cubed. Of course, there's lots and lots and lots of units of volume, teaspoons, tablespoons, cups, pints, quarts, gallons, uh, cubic feet, cubic miles, uh, on and on. So, but the SI unit is meters cubed, uh, milliliters and liters, a couple more, but those are not SI. They're metric, but they're not SI. All right, so solve the above equation for volume. All right, go ahead and pause the video. Do the algebra and then unpause. All right, so let's see how you did. Is this what you came up with? If not, pause the video, redo it, find your mistake. Usually about 40, 50% of the people do this wrong. It's not hard algebra, but if you do two things at once, it's easy to get it wrong. So make sure you can do that algebra. Um, this applies to other things as well, um, where you, where you could do the algebra wrong for something where it's, a, it's, you know, something equals something else divided by something else. This format, you'll see it a lot in science concepts. Uh, so, you know, like acceleration equals force over mass, pressure equals uh, force over area. Um, I don't know. There's lots of other ones, but you want to be able to do basic algebra and not make a mistake. So check that out. All right, so here's an example. Um, solid ball, mass 50 grams, and this given density, what's the volume? Well, we have the equation from before. This equation's not on your equation sheet, at least not written this way. It's written this way. So if we hadn't already just done this, you'd write this down because this is the one on your equation sheet. And the next step would be to do the algebra to get from here to here. I would do it in two steps if I were you. And then fill it in. Notice that this is not an SI unit. This is not SI units, but it's okay. It does work out gram per gram per centimeter cubed. It does work out to be a centimeter cubed. Okay. 
and we could write that out longhand. Right. Gram, oh, gram per gram per centimeter cubed. And then we could, in the denominator, we want to get rid of the denominator entirely. So we multiply by the inverse. So that's going to cancel those. But we have to do the same thing in the numerator. Forgive my lousy handwriting, which is made even worse by writing with the mouse. But anyway, oh, let me back up. This thing inside the parentheses, that's one. And so again, the way we came up with this fancy one centimeter cube per gram over centimeter cube per gram is we looked at the denominator, we did the inverse, and then we repeated it in the numerator. So we picked it because it's going to cancel out the denominator. But then we've got what's left, grams per gram. And then that leaves us with centimeters cubed. And so we do the math on our calculator or in our heads, and we get 20 centimeters cubed. We can also check our work. So this is a way you can check that you did your algebra correct. We got an answer of 20 centimeters cubed. So we go back here and we take our mass, which was 50 grams. We divide by 20 centimeters cubed, and we should be able to get the density that we were given if we did the algebra correct, if we punch the numbers on our calculator correctly, and it does work out. 50 over 20 is 2.5, so that matches. All right, so that's a good way to check your work. Go back to the original equations before you started messing around doing algebra on them. Plug in the numbers, see if it works out. All right, an object floats in ethyl alcohol, but sinks when it's placed in another fluid. Use the density table in your textbook and name two possibilities for this other fluid. All right, oh, I cut out most of these, so you're not gonna send me your answer. Uh, I did find most of the other ones. Um, anyway, go ahead and think about that. Go ahead and pause the video and go to 11.1 uh, in your textbook and see if you can figure it out. All right, so first thing is we need to think about what makes something float or not. Well, it has to do with density. Uh, something will float when it is less dense than the fluid that it's in. So I'm making that as general as possible by using the word fluid, not water, um, not liquid, but fluid. Something will float when the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid. So this object floats in ethyl alcohol. So the object has to be less dense than ethyl alcohol. All right, so let's go look for something that is Oh, wait a minute, the object. So we, we don't need to know what the object is. We need to know what the other fluid could be. And so this object sinks in another fluid. Well, let's go and see if we can figure that out. So ethyl alcohol has a density of 0 0.79, but the object sinks when it's another fluid. So we're, we're really looking for another fluid that has a lower density and petrol, just like gasoline, has a density lower. So the object could have a density of 0 0.7. If the object had a density of 0 0.7, and units would be uh, grams per milliliter, or, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, if it was 0 0.7 grams per milliliter, it would, it would float in ethyl alcohol because 0 0.7 is less than 0 0.79, and it would sink in petrol because petrol has a density of 0 0.68. And then people look up and down this list and they're like, no, 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 no. And they're like, I only see one. All right, well, let's look around, see if we see any things that have a density lower than 0 0.79. Well, none of these things would even qualify because they're all solids, okay? There's, a, there's one with a lower density, but that's not a fluid. And then we look, gases. Are gases fluids? Absolutely. Do any of these gases have a density lower than 0 0.79? Yes, all of them. Okay, we're talking about densities of 0 0.00129 grams per milliliter. That's really low. And that makes sense. Gases have very low density. So you can answer petrol. And then any of these, any gas has a density lower than 0 0.79 and would fit in with that. All right, now let's talk about what this means, 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. So that's something that is, you'll see that uh, from time to time, especially uh, outside of textbooks. If you're in industry, 
kind of things um, where they're reporting values in a table. They'll report it like this. It makes the numbers easier to read, but it still retains the unit that they want. So 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. So what that means is whatever this number is times 1,000, that's the number in kilograms per cubic meter. So one times 1,000, water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or blood, 1.05 times 1,000. So that means blood has a density of 1,050 kilograms per cubic meter, or mercury, super dense liquid. Really fun to watch YouTube videos of people uh, putting things in mercury. Um, for example, steel has a density of 7,800 kilograms per cubic meter, and mercury has a density of 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter. So you can take an anvil and put it into a container of mercury, uh, which you should not be doing yourself because mercury is very toxic. So you don't want to be doing that, but watching a YouTube video, as far as I know, is pretty safe and you will not get mercury poisoning from watching the YouTube video of that. All right. So that fully answers that question. And now we will move on to pressure. All right, pressure is equal to force over area. Now, have we seen any of these symbols before? Not quite. We have seen a P before, do you remember? Lowercase p stood for momentum and lowercase a stood for acceleration. But this is P for pressure and A for area, capital P, capital A. Now. It's not really a big concern because we're not usually dealing with uh, acceleration in the same um, problem as pressure, but it could happen, but that's easy to distinguish. It's very easy to write a lowercase a that looks nothing like a capital A. So those are easy to tell apart. Um, and we usually don't have momentum and pressure in the, in the same problem. I, I can't remember ever doing that in physics 111. So that's pretty straightforward, but you can draw capital P with a little thing under it and a lowercase p without a thing under it. Um, even put a little fancy at the top like that. All right. Oh, but remember, you need to make your p's not look like a row. And a row looks like this. Oh, not like that. Let's try again. Oh, man, this crazy thing. There we go. So I even put a little curly cue at the beginning. You can just go up and around like that. Um, but again, slanted and curvy, okay? Not straight up and down and 90 degree angle. So that's how you can tell the difference. All right. All right, units, oh, units. Units have to be the same on both sides. This has units of Newton and area meters squared. And so one Newton per meter squared is defined to be equal to one Pascal. Okay, so the unit of pressure is capital P lowercase a, and the symbol for pressure is P. Those are two different things. This stands for, this is the variable, and this is the unit. All right, so variables and units are totally different. Now, atmospheric pressure, okay? The atmosphere is made up of air and air is a fluid and fluids, whether gases or liquids, all exert pressure on you because the uh, atoms or molecules that make up a liquid or a gas, they are moving around, okay? And I'm talking about air here, but it's just as applicable to water or oil or soda or anything else the molecules and, and atoms that make up those fluids are moving around in all different directions, okay? So you're probably familiar with going down in a, a pool or in whenever you're swimming in a lake or whatever, as you go down further and further, you, you notice the pressure increases, okay? So you're familiar with water exerting pressure on you, okay? At least most people are, but air does the same thing. Okay, whether it's a gas or a liquid, you can think about each of those little atoms or molecules like a ping pong ball. And you may have seen like in a lottery machine where they're, uh, they're, they're picking the numbers for the daily lottery, the pick three or whatever. 
and all the numbers are bouncing around in there. Well, that's that's what's happening. All the air molecules are going all over the place, random directions, and they're exerting pressure because they're they're applying a little force. They hit your arm, they hit the ceiling, they hit the wall, everything, and they're applying a little force. And each of those surfaces has an area, so we can take that force divided by the area and get the pressure. All right, and we've got a little video here. And there's no sound associated with it. Well, there, there's some music that plays, but you probably won't even be able to hear that. But well, let's just check this out. So they've taken a soda can, they put some water in it, just a couple tablespoons of water. They wait till the water's boiling. They've got steam coming out. And you usually don't want to wait as long as they did. You want to flip it over more quickly than that. Pretty cool. I recommend you try it. Impress your uh, parents, brothers, kids, uh, cousins. Really cool demonstration. Highly recommend it. So just be careful of the steam. The can is hot. Some, some good tongs really help. Uh, you can do it with... Um, something cloth like a pot holder uh, you just have to be careful sometimes those aren't real good at gripping the can so just be careful not to burn yourself but really fun demonstration to do for to, to impress other people just make sure you get it good and steamy so we can see a good steady stream of steam coming out the top uh, what what crushes the can that's the interesting thing that's why this is here uh, what is it that crushes the can air does it's the air outside that crushes the can so air is always pushing on the outside of the can, but usually there's an equal pressure pushing out. Uh, when you flip it over, the steam that's inside the can condenses very quickly. And before anything else can go in to take the place of the steam, uh, the can gets crushed. So there's a, another demonstration. You can look up a railroad car. And in fact, I think that's part of what you're doing in your student note packet. So I'll just leave it at that. All right, so what are the takeaways here? Atmospheric pressure is very large. Uh, and if you watch the railroad tanker video, which you're supposed to, that will uh, reinforce that message even more. Okay, even though we don't notice it, we're just used to it. Okay, but it really is a big force. Um, it's 14.7 pounds per square inch. A square inch is not very big. Um, this part of my ruler, the end of the ruler, um, that's one square inch because this is one inch, this is one inch this way. And so that's one square inch. And there's about 15 pounds of force on every square inch. So that's a lot. If you have a piece of paper that's eight and a half by 11, um, that's about 88 square inches. And multiply 88 times 15, let's see 88 times 15, that's over a thousand pounds. Um, I got 1320, but there's an approximation anyway. So over 1300 pounds of force pushing on just a regular old piece of paper. All right, in SI units, oh, also, while I'm on this, people talk about PSI a lot, but PSI hides what's really there. It's pounds per square inch. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, pound, that's a unit of force, and square inch, that's a unit of area, force per area. Look, force per area. So PSI actually helps you remember what the formula for pressure is but it's on the equation sheet, so you don't need to, but you know, maybe sometime down the road, you'll think about that and you'll be able to remember you're filling up your tires, trying to get them up to the right uh, pressure, which is a good idea if you, put, if you keep your tires at the recommended pressure because you'll get better gas mileage. It's also safer. Um, so you'll be filling up your tires to 44 PSI or whatever your tires recommend. Make sure you read it on the sidewall of the tire. And you'll think PSI, that's, Dr. B said that's pounds per square inch. Oh yeah, force, I'm sorry, pressure. So you go to force over area. Anyway, it's just a way to remember it. In SI units, the SI unit, as I mentioned before, is Pascal. Pascal is a really small amount of pressure. It's one Newton per meter squared. A meter is like three feet, okay? So a square meter is three feet by three feet, and one Newton is a tiny amount, okay? You know, like this pen might weigh a couple of Newtons. Okay, one Newton is not very much. Well, maybe it's a whole Newton. I don't know. But 
a newton's not very much but this much force over a, a square meter is a tiny amount of pressure so you can see 101 pascals this number is on your equation sheet okay on the back of your equation sheet down near the bottom there's a section that's where it has it might list it in scientific notation like 1.013 times 10 to the third pascals but it's there so I'll make sure you see it uh, there's other things like densities on there for some common things like seawater regular water air uh, steel I think anyway make sure you know that those are there because if you run into a problem on a quiz and it requires you to know those well you don't really need to know them you just need to look it up um, and if it's not on a quiz you can obviously just look in table 11.1 .1 in your textbook or or somewhere else all right fluid pressure varies with depth okay here's a graph of that and the graph is, is drawn upside down just so it kind of makes sense physically as you go down pressure goes up okay so this is the depth and this is the pressure okay pressure increases with depth and like i said most people are familiar with that from going swimming there's an equation for it which is p2 equals p1 plus rho gh i just noticed these p's are leaning forward a little remember when you're writing your p's make those sticks nice and straight okay oh not plus anyway just make your sticks nice and straight just erase that all right um, and then for your row that's when you want to lean it forward again it's just really helpful to keep those straight um so p2 is the pressure at some depth okay it's h meters below wherever point one is okay so point two is h meters below point one okay row notice this one is not leaning forward microsoft fonts do all kinds of crazy things to greek letters um g remember that's not negative Okay, G is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. G, lowercase g, cannot be negative. Okay, A sub Y, acceleration in the Y direction, that can be negative, but lowercase g cannot. And then H is the vertical distance. All right, again, don't mix up those symbols. So, this is pretty straightforward. You can apply it to lots of things. Um, I will point out, though, if you are talking about finding the pressure at some depth below the surface of like a swimming pool or the ocean or something. And so you think about point one being right here at the surface, and then you're going down some depth H below, maybe to the ocean floor, which is, well, it depends. It's anywhere from a few inches below the surface when you're just stepping your feet in at the beach to uh, thousands of feet. Uh, below, but anyway, when you're trying to find the pressure down here, say at the, the sea floor, as an example, the pressure here is not zero because what's what's up here? What's all this stuff up here? This is all air, and air exerts pressure. So you've got to use the pressure of air as P1, and then you add to it. And this is the density of the fluid. This is, well, you know what the rest is. All right. So just remember, this is atmospheric pressure if you're using that, okay? All right, now we're gonna get into buoyant force. Buoyant force does not vary with depth, okay? Pressure does, but buoyant force does not. So I just start off because we just came from pressure as a function of depth, so I just like to contrast that right away. All right, what's Archimedes' principle say? You may know of Archimedes. He did lots of cool stuff. You're gonna read about some of that uh, as you're doing your packet. Um, he may or may not have run naked through the streets yelling, Eureka! Who knows? Makes a good story, though. All right, buoyant force is equal to rho GV. Looks kind of similar to that equation we had on the last slide. P2 equals P1 plus rho GH. All right, but it is different, and it's not hard to remember because both of those equations are where? On your equation sheet. You got it. All right. So a couple of things to keep in mind. This is not the density of the object, okay? This is the density of the fluid, okay? And even though this is not leaning forward, this is the Greek letter rho, okay? The volume is the volume of fluid displaced, 
Okay, displaced means pushed out of the way. Okay, so water gets pushed out of the way whenever you put an object into a fluid. Okay, like you've got the bathtub filled up three inches, and you put your you put your kid in there to give him a bath. The water level rises some. Okay, it doesn't necessarily spill out of the tub. Hopefully, it doesn't. Um, but it there is some water displaced. So the amount of water displaced. Um, that's what goes in here. Okay. In fact, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of that fluid displaced. Okay. So this is really um, the weight, the weight density, and then this is the volume. Or you could think of this times this. That's the mass, and then you multiply it by g to get the weight. All right. Now, question. Will the volume of fluid displaced always be equal to the object's volume? The answer is no. In fact, the example I gave with putting your child into the bathtub, and if you don't have a kid, that's fine. You can imagine when you were a kid taking a bath, okay? But you don't go all the way under the water. So the amount of water displaced is not equal to the person's volume. The amount of water displaced is smaller Okay, right here in this example, in this right here, when they lower it down in, let's see if we can get that to run again. Um, let's see, I think it will anyway. When this gets lowered down in, this much water spilled out. And so this volume is equal to this vol the volume of this object. But if it had only been lowered in halfway, then this volume would be half as much, but the, vo the objects, volume would still be the same. So if we lower it only partway in, then the volume of fluid displaced is not equal to the volume of the object. Okay. And remember the, ob the liquid or, or I'm sorry, fluid, the fluid does not have to be spilled to be displaced. Okay. It just gets pushed out and sometimes just goes up and raises the level like in a bathtub or a swimming pool. All right. Now, we're going to do some true or false, and I'm actually going to wait and do those in the next video. So we're going to stop here. See you next time.